Good evening my beautiful brothers and sisters in Yeshua. Today is Saturday the 18th of November 2023. It is 10.22pm here in Australia. I hope you're doing very well and I hope you've been blessed. Um, brothers and sisters, sorry that I haven't been on for a while. I just haven't been sort of led to make a video as such. And, um, you know, I've just been studying and going about my usual things that I do, researching and everything like that. Um, I just sort of felt a little bit like I'm not quite entirely sure what Father wants me to look at now or anything like this. But in the last couple of days, um, I've really been led in the spirit to research more about the oil. Um, as we know from my last video, I was talking about uh, Revelation chapter 11, how it talks about the two witnesses when their bodies are lying dead on the street. For three and a half days, you notice that the people are being merry and giving each other gifts. So I'm like, this has got to mean something to do with Christmas. It just has to do. So I've been really, um, you know, really led to look into the oil. You know, that's just what's been pressed on my heart, especially the last couple of days um, because of Hanukkah. And if you have a look at one of their um, stories in the Talmud, because you don't necessarily read this in the Bible, because you don't read anything about Hanukkah in the Bible, um, except for the Apocrypha books, 1st Maccabees. And um, so there's this thing in the Talmud called the miracle of the oil. And so... Um, and if you haven't seen my previous video or two videos ago, I did a uh, scripture reading of First Maccabees where it talks about the abomination of desolation, where Hanukkah comes from and all this kind of stuff. But um, they have this thing called the miracle of oil. So when they went to rededicate the temple, they had enough oil for one night because in the rituals or the ceremonies that they had to do, um, you had to press the olives, I think for eight days. So they had enough for one night and they got to, you know, pressing the oil and stuff like that. But this oil apparently lasted for eight days. So they call this the miracle of the oil anyway. So, um, you know, so I'm looking and I'm thinking oil, that's got to be so significant because, you know, the five wise and the five foolish uh, you know, virgins, the story there was that the five wise ones had enough oil and the foolish ones didn't have enough oil. So I'm like, okay, this has got to be, this has got to be, um, you know, it's got to do with Hanukkah. It has to do with Hanukkah and it has to do with the Christmas season. And I just think the gifts giving and the being merry, it's just, you know, all pointing to this season. So long story short, um, I was just looking at stuff and I came across this video um, here by brother Troy Black. Many people probably watch him because he's got like 419,000 subscribers. But anyway, I don't normally watch it because um, I'm not a huge watcher of people who have a word from the Lord. You know, it's um, I'd rather spend my time like just searching the scriptures and and having my own personal relationship. But for some reason, I really felt led to watch this particular word from the Lord. And um, I think mainly because it said <clears throat> um, in the title that God told me it's coming by Christmas. So I thought, well, I'm looking at Christmas. I'm looking at Hanukkah. I'm looking at the oil. Let's see what this word is. And um, so this is a very lovely, wonderful word he actually gave. It's a lot of encouragement and things like this. But... He said in this prophecy that he was talking about, or this word from the Lord, he mentioned the year 1987. And he said, I don't know, but he didn't mention anything other than that, just that, you know, he, he's seen this year, 1987. So I straight away, my spirit's like, well, I'm going to research 1987. So when I put in 1987, uh, major news events in history... I've seen here the first Simpsons cartoon short is shown on the Tracy Almond's show during April. And I thought, well, that's very significant because um, the Simpsons have basically predicted everything that we've seen, um, you know, in forever. So 9-11 and 
um, you know, the pandemic and all these sorts of stuff. I mean, you know, as well as I do, that the Simpsons have been right up there with Trump, you know, Trump's election and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, so I thought, all right, I'll go check out what that first episode was. It was nothing special. Apparently in 1987, there was this show, uh, Tracy Ullman's show, and basically it had like three minute skits called The Simpsons Shorts. And, um, you know, that's that's how it sort of started. And then later on down the track, it became full half an hour episodes. Anyway, so as I'm looking into this, I had a look at The Simpsons Shorts and looked a little bit more into it and, you know, came across the guy, Matt Groening. Okay, so I have a look at him research about him a little bit trying to find some information and he basically was a comic comic uh, script writer before the simpsons right and his comic was called life in hell and i was like okay and so basically so he's done futurama disenchantment life in hell and the simpsons Okay, so Life in Hell here. This is the little um, comic uh, thing that he did in 1978. And if you come down here, this is all the books. Uh, where was it? Uh, this is all his, um, th his work here. Love is Hell, Work is Hell, School is Hell. Box Full of Hell, Childhood is Hell, Greetings from Hell, The Big Book of Hell, With Love from Hell, How to Go to Hell, The Road to Hell, Love is Hell, The Huge Book of Hell. And um, yeah, so I thought, okay, this is um, pretty significant that this guy is literally just writing about hell. So I go and check that out. Now this is, it's getting somewhere, brothers and sisters, like this is pretty cool. Well, you know, cool. It's amazing, actually. So I check out this um, Life is Hell, and it just um, sort of goes on to, you know, talk about this comic and everything like that. And so I just, for some reason, what, what is this? I wrote, oh, I, I um, copied and pasted one of his books, How to Get to Hell. I thought, geez, that's interesting. I want to see this. So... I put that into DuckDuckGo and scrolled down and seen this 11 hidden spots to enter the underworld. And I'm like, what is this? So I click on it. And um, it's just this article by Atlas Obscura. And then we come down here. The first one is in Greece, in Cape Matapan. And the second one, brothers and sisters, is a place called Hekla in Iceland. And I'm like, no way. I mean, look at Iceland. If you don't know what's going on in Iceland at the moment, pause this video, go and have a look what's going on in Iceland. It is literally exploding. Like there's going, there's going to be a cease to Iceland very, very soon. There's volcanoes. There's thousands of earthquakes a day, every day. It is horrendous. Now, when you have a look at this map here, um, you know what I mean? It's just like, it literally looks like the portal to hell. Go down here. I read this section here. Our new location, the imposing strato volcano known as Hekla can be found in the southern mountains of Iceland, a fiery pit of lava that has long been associated with the fiery pit of Christian tradition. <laughs> in the Middle Ages, Cistercian monks travelled far and wide across Europe carrying tales of Hecla Fell. Okay. Um, oh, I haven't read any further than this. Let's just keep reading. This is interesting. I see Judas here. Um, in 1180, the monk Herbert de Clairvaux named the volcano in his book, Liber de Miraculis, 
he wrote the renowned fiery cauldron of sicily which men call hell's chimney that cauldron is affirmed to be like a small furnace oh my goodness this is like literally the bottomless pit brothers and sisters a great furnace is going to come out of that thing compared to this enormous inferno the monk benedict named hecla as an internal prison of judas <gasps> and who did satan enter into hmm in his poem about the voyages of St. Brendan from 1120, later in 1341, the medieval Icelandic manuscripts Flatty Book Annual describe large birds that were reportedly seen flying inside the fiery crater. These were believed to be the souls of the damned. Oh my goodness, there have been more than 20 serious eruption recorded since uh, 874 AD although in recent years Hecla has been somewhat more peaceful most superstitions regarding the volcano died out by the 19th century nevertheless local folklore still tells of witches who gather around the volcano's peak each Easter oh my goodness and this next one here is Fangdu City of Ghosts I'll just quickly read um, Lacus Curtius um, Actun Tunichi Magna Cave, the gates of Guinea, Pluto's Gate in Turkey, hmm. St. Patrick's Purgatory, Chin Ioki. Jigokua, the seven gates of hell in Pennsylvania, cave of civil. Okay, so let's go back up to this Iceland one because I want to show you something, brothers and sisters. Okay, so I um, copied and pasted Hecla and went on to... Uh, the Wikipedia here about Hecla, and it says Hecla, or he Hecla, is an active stratovolcano in the south of Iceland with a height of 1,491 meters. Hecla is one of Iceland's most active volcanoes. Over 20 eruptions have occurred in and around the volcano since the year 1210. During the Middle Ages, the Icelandic Norse called the volcano the Gateway to Hell. And the idea spread over much of Europe. Hecla is part of a volcanic ridge 40 k's long. The most active part of this ridge, a fuser about 5.5 long named Heklagia, is considered to be within Helka's proper. Helka looks rather like an overturned boat with its Keel being a series of craters, two of which are generally the most active. Okay, so um, I just wanted to show you that, brothers and sisters, because this place is literally on fire at the moment, you know, like with volcanoes, it's on lava. The floor is lava, literally. And it is about to um, explode. So I'm just going to go quickly and have a quick look at Iceland to show you um, in case you don't know what I'm talking about here. Okay, I'll just show you a little bit of this news footage and then we'll go have a look at a few other things. Well, Iceland is bracing for a possible volcanic eruption. The country has declared a state of emergency and evacuated thousands of citizens. Earthquakes have been reported on a peninsula in the southwest of the country. Researchers have also detected sulfur dioxide there. That's a gas that indicates that magma is near the ground surface. Oh my goodness, sulfur. <laughs> That's literally like brimstone, you know. All the seismic activity is causing cracks in the road there, and an entire town on the peninsula has been evacuated. Vincent Dorwan joins us now. He's a geo... Okay, let's check this out.
Hello and greetings from Iceland. It's time for an update since over 8,000 earthquakes have been recorded since the seismic unrest started a few days ago. So, so this is two weeks ago. Um, what date? What date? 30th of October. And this... So it started a few days ago from 30th of October and he just said over 8,000 earthquakes and that was then. Okay, it's already this the 18th of November here. So this is pretty incredible, brothers and sisters. Like what if this is literally where the bottomless pit is? What if this is the gateway to hell? You know, I mean, this is for long been in tradition that this was the actual gateway to hell. So is this why Iceland is, um, you know, is this why it's happening at the moment? So I just thought I'd share that with you, brothers and sisters. And, um, yeah. So as I was talking about um, the oil before, um, you know, I've, I've been looking at where oil is and I've just felt for the last couple of days that this parable here the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamp and went forth to meet the bridegroom i think it's probably a good time to revisit this um, parable because i think it's of high significance to the um, hanukkah season to the christmas season and it's got a wonderful lesson in it in this and also an absolutely terrifying lesson now um you know, my beautiful brothers and sisters, the video that I did a little on the last one or the one before that, where I was talking to you about the two witnesses, you know, lying dead on the street. And then I was, you know, and then they were, um, what do you call it? After three and a half days, father put the spirit in them and then they rose up on their feet and then went to heaven. And um, you see the, ne the very next thing that happens basically is the judgment judgment happens so I'm like oh my goodness are we that far into it is there like is this the end basically is this the end and then it got me really studying and really looking into the fact about this whole second chance thing now brothers and sisters I want to warn you before I go into this study that this isn't probably going to be a tickling of the ears study but that is not my job to do that. It is my job to be faithful to Father. And because I think we're running out of time, I really think we're running out of time and we're just going to stop being foolish and just playing with, with Father. Because if the Word says something, we need to be absolutely sure about it because it's life and death here. It's really life and death. And... Um, so I want to read this parable here with you and I want you to note something. And as we're reading, I'll talk a little bit more about it. Okay, Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil in them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lambs. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No. Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I said unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man travelling into a far country, 
who called his own servants and delivered them unto his good. Actually, I'll stop there because that's another parable. Okay, so I wanted to focus on chap, uh, verse 10. Um, basically 9 and 10. Okay, so the wise answered saying, Not so, let there be not enough for us and for you. Go and to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they were gone... The bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Okay, and the Lord said, the Lord basically said to them, I don't know who you are. This is very, very sobering, brothers and sisters, because I'm starting to think and realize that maybe the whole left behind theology is another deception of Satan. Because in each instance, you do not get the door to reopen once the door has been shut. And um, when we go into Luke 21, you see down here, um, for as a snare shall it come on all of them that dwell on the face of the earth, so this is why it says, you know, the, the wise and the foolish, they all went to sleep. But when the bridegroom came, when he started coming and then everybody got up, they got ready, they trimmed their lamps. The, the, uh, the wise ones had plenty of oil and the foolish ones, they didn't have any oil. And they were told, quick, you know, go to them that sell that you can have some. And while they were gone, the door was shut, brothers and sisters. You know, the bridegroom came, he took the wise, and the doors were shut. You know, and it's going to come like a snare on all of us, even to us. You know, this is why it says, you know, um, Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be counted worthy to escape all of the things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Uh, and back in Matthew 24, he says down here, um, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord does come, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would have not suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore also be ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Okay, blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when, his, when he cometh, shall find him doing. But, and if that evil servant says in his heart, Lord, my Lord delayeth his coming, and he shall go back to eat and drink with the drunkards, and to, to smite his fellow servants, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him in an hour that he's not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brothers and sisters, this does not sound like a second chance. This doesn't sound like a second chance. <sighs> you know, we have the... The Laodicean church too. Oh, how I wish you were hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Does that sound like a second chance, brothers and sisters? So, um, you know, I, I did not intend to do a video. I just wanted to bring across this thing about Iceland and about how, you know, in history it was called... Uh, um, you know, called the gateway of hell. I thought how relevant for the time that we're in. But I asked Father, you know, to speak through me and if there's anything that he wants me to tell his beloved children, including myself. And I truly think it's this, brothers and sisters. I truly think that the books of probation are going to close very, very shortly. Very shortly. Because when that snare comes upon the whole world, 
okay, upon all of the world, we've got to be ready. And if we're not ready, we're going to be left out in the out of darkness. So I just want you to really consider this and, and take it to Father in prayer. Take it to Father in prayer. But I truly think, brothers and sisters, that it's, I don't know, I've just got this feeling that the the left behind theory is not correct. I think that might be Satan's way of convincing us that, oh, it's all good. If you don't go the first time, you can go the second time. And this is why I think Father's showing me how far, how far we are in the book of Revelation, that it possibly could be so close to the end because when you look at it brothers and sisters like I've said many times before we go to Revelation 13 and this is you know I've said many times um, you know we're not here for this we're not here for this it's for the um, left behind people and all this but now I'm realizing that <coughs> the left behind people are the lost ones they're the lost ones. And, you know, I, I don't want this message any more than you do, brothers and sisters. It's a hard message to give because it would be nice to, you know, to know that our loved ones, our lukewarm loved ones are going to be okay. But I don't think it works like that, brothers and sisters. So, you know, like I said, I would rather give you all pink roses and fairy floss, but I think we're just coming to the end now and there's no more time to fluff around, basically. So here in Revelation 13, you see that, um, you know, where are we? And all the world wandered after the beast. All of the world, brothers and sisters. So the whole world wandered after the beast. And this is before... This is before he even there is even a forcing of the um, you know the mark, and you know I was talking to my brother on Discord and we were going through talking about you know if we're like that close to the end like if, if everything's literally finishing finishing up now and you know we don't have all this time to go afterwards. But I, I'm just, I was just thinking that it's a, it is a possibility, brothers and sisters, and you know I haven't, I haven't wanted to um, say this because you know I myself, I have a son, my eldest son, my dad, my two sisters, they've taken the jib jab, and. If what I feel from Father, that we are very, very close to the end, the end, where we've had to endure to the end, to be saved. If, if that is indeed correct, brothers and sisters, and it's, you know, I will continue. I'll, I might just make that video about studying more and showing you in scripture too, why I think it's a high possibility that we've come to the end. And what I mean by the end, I mean the end of our chance of salvation that's what I mean there is going to be a time I think once we're taken um, to heaven you know and protected while God's wrath comes down on this earth and that's another thing you know there's another verification that this very well could be the end end for salvation is because we're not appointed to wrath so once we're out of here that's all that's left is Father's wrath. Okay, so we have to be real here. And like I said, it's hard for me to say this because my, you know, I have my beautiful boy, my eldest boy, and it breaks my heart, but I trust Father. I trust Father in all things. And if that's the case, if the jib jab was, you know, if it was the mark or it could very well be a precursor to the mark 
and that's effectively it was a test I, I I truly believe that it was a test I truly believe that the jib jab was a test and unfortunately a lot of people took it and um I don't know I don't know brothers and sisters I can't say thus saith the Lord that that was absolutely the mark of the beast <sighs> but if what I'm seeing is correct then I would say that those who took it you know there may be a chance there may be a chance of redemption still for these people who took it if they they if they fall to their knees right now and accept Yeshua Jesus Christ into their life and just give it all to God they literally have to surrender everything right now I think that's the only way until that that second hands just eventually it's it's going to stop the hour the last piece of sand in the hourglass is going to you know because I think those people who haven't repented you know the the Christians or whatever that's taken the jib jab and they haven't repented of it sincerely and given father everything I think they're going to be part of this the whole world wandered after the beast verse because if they they've already got half a heart for him you know because effectively that's the reality of it brothers and sisters I'm sorry to be so harsh but you didn't trust almighty God you didn't trust almighty God you you loved your life your job more than your trust in him and if you don't repent for that sincerely right now you know if your heart is hardened just to to not fall into your knees and weeping and mourning and fasting and all the things um i truly think that these people are going to be highly susceptible to taking the mask and the, the you know the mark i mean not the mast. um so i don't know i don't know but i it just when you like i said before when i've read revelations 13 to you like I said, you know, before even the forcing of the mark, the whole world is wandering after him. And, you know, they're like, oh, who is like unto the beast? And who is able to make war with him? This has got to be Trump, eh? It's got to be Trump. Because um, who is able to make war with him? Trump is going to be the one that's going to be the saviour of the world. And I'm not talking that as and that's what I think and I feel because I know who my saviour is. I'm talking about who the world is going to consider the saviour of them because he's going to be able to institute that peace process and, um, I mean, the evangelical community, they love him more than God. And I know a lot of people write to me and say, oh, we don't worship him and we don't, you know, Trump's a man chosen by God. I said, yeah, yeah, I know, he is. But, you know, Judas was chosen by Father as well. And Pharaoh was chosen by Father as well. You know, every person was meant to play the role that they play. And Father uses evil people for judgment on his people because they refused to listen to him. You know, and this guy, he opens his mouth and blasphemies against God and blasphemies his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Okay, so you watch. I bet you that's Trump. And then once we're safely in the heavenly ark, he's literally going to be raising his fist to the heavens and us who dwell in them. And he's going to be blaspheming God, right? And, um, you know, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Okay. All of the people on earth shall worship him. And the whole world wandered after the beast. And these people 
their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundations of the world. And this is the thing, brothers and sisters, that this is why you've got to have the trust. As hard as it is to look at your loved ones that are lukewarm and go, oh, I can't live without my children. I can't live without my husband. I can't live without my sister. I can't live without my brother. This is where you are not to be like Lot's wife. Because there is a promise in the scriptures that says that Father will wipe away every tear and that we're not going to remember the former things. We've got to have trust in that. We're not going to remember the former things. I think it's uncomprehendable to think, you know, that my lukewarm two eldest boys... There's a great possibility, a very high possibility that, that they're not going to enter into heaven. And that's hard. That is hard. But I'm here to let you know, brothers and sisters, that everything will work out the way that it should. And Father will wipe away every tear from our eyes and we will not remember the former things. It's like when you are having giving birth and you're going through almighty pain. And then once the baby is in your arms, all that pain fades away. We have to trust. We have to trust in him. This is going to be the greatest trust exercise the world has ever seen. But there's no more time to fluff around. Your salvation. You need to think about you now. We're so worried about our loved ones and even our pets. Oh, I can't live without my pet. And you can't live like that, brothers and sisters. If you are worried, you know, it says in, in Revelate, in, I'm not sure what chapter it's right near the end, it could be chapter 22, that the fear and doubting shall not inherit the kingdom. The fear and doubting shall not inherit the kingdom so many are called but so few are chosen you know and then you may look at the verse where it says you know a multitude that no man can count is standing in heaven and you think there you go see it's a, a number that no man can count brothers and sisters think about this from the time of Adam up until about maybe 30 years ago, people were faithful. The Christians, look what the Christians did. You know, they, they died. There was lots of martyrs. They would, um, you know, even in the 60s and 70s, everyone had their Sunday outfit. Everyone had their shoes. Everybody prayed grace on the table everybody was a lot more living for God and God was spoken about in the community you know Bible there was prayers at school that's going to be a multitude that no man can number all of those people from Adam okay and all the people after Christ but in our generation, the Laodicean generation, it's going to be so sparing. It's going to be so sparing. And this, brothers and sisters, is why you see over and over and over again when people have dreams or visions of the rapture, the one thing that's the most common thing they say is, I thought there would have been more. I'm looking around, I see, yeah, hundreds and thousands but I thought there was going to be so many more. And I just noticed how common that is that people say these things. People expect, you know, just trillions of balls of light shooting up into the sky. And <sighs> But this is eternal life we're talking about. The gift that Yeshua took on, he took on every person's sin on his shoulders and this is why this is how we repay him 
by being of utmost faith. By trusting in him and his father completely and wholly and solely. Because even though we we as parents and mothers and brothers and sisters and fathers, even though we love our loved ones here on earth, we wouldn't have them for starters if it wasn't by the grace of God. So this is going to be a huge exercise for us, brothers and sisters, and this is why we need to pitch up our arcs just as Noah did. We need to pitch up every single hole of uh, where we're doubting and make sure that our faith and our oil cannot leak out or stream out in some cases. Brothers and sisters, I truly think that we've come to the end. I truly think we've come to the end and why Father has been showing me about Satan being bound, you know, because everything, like I've always said, everything that we've ever been shown by the Lord, when we really ask him in prayer and in fervent desire of knowing his kingdom, like that video that I showed you before from uh, Troy Black, he was he gave a great example of a verse in scripture he said you know a lot of people worry about you know when they get a word from the lord or they they they're scared that they don't know if it's from the lord and he said he he um shared the verse of you know what father would give his child um a snake if he asked for you know bread or something like that and then you know he he elaborated on it and said you know Yeshua Jesus Christ gives us the protection. Okay, if we're seeking the kingdom of heaven first and we're doing it out of just wanting to have a better personal relationship, a better walk with Father, um, and we asked that to, to, to know Father's secrets and, you know, to search out his, the kingdom of heaven, then we will get that. He will protect and provide for us and not let the enemy come anywhere near us. You know, we've got to have more faith that everything that we've been shown is for, if we're really seeking the kingdom of heaven, everything that we've ever been shown, you know, whether it was 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 5 minutes ago, nothing of it is in vain. And this is why I know that when I go down these so-called rabbit holes of where I was saying, no, the millennial reign is not in a thousand years time. The millennial reign is quite very possible have to have already happened, but it was a spiritual reign because Christ said that he gave us all the power over the scorpions and the serpents and over all evil. You know, and, and the fact that um, he had bound Satan because if Satan was on this earth, brothers and sisters, look what he did to Job. Yes, evil is on this earth. And yes, it's ramping up because Satan is just about to be released. That's what Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is talking about. You know what withholds him now and when he's going to be released and let him go. Okay, that man of sin is going to be revealed. Okay. And the day of Christ cannot come until that happens. Until what happens? To Satan gets released. Okay, and the man of sin is revealed. It's always going to be at the 11th hour and the 59th minute. I tell you that. This is, this is what's going to test our faith and everything in these last moments. When all else fails... When everything seems lost and hopeless, that's when Father will intervene. And he will snatch us from off the face of the earth and bring us safely into the heavenly kingdom, into the places that his son prepared for us. So, like I said, brothers and sisters, this is um, 
you know I truly believe this is why father had me looking at the millennial reign and the fact that Satan you know he's bound and we've had the power and this is why Christ said now go into all the nations and spread the gospel um, and you know heal people and you know work these miracles in my father's name we couldn't have done that if Satan was on this earth Christ when he went down into Hades into hell to free the captives on his death when he died on the cross he went down into hell and he freed the captives and he also bind up the enemy okay this is the good man binding up that enemy there's a scripture actually in the bible in Matthew I think it is or it could be Mark and Luke where he says you know that you need to go in and bind the man first and then you can go and rob him no that's not right but something to do with binding someone something or someone basically you know you have to you have to bind this person before you can do these other things and that's exactly what Christ did he bound Satan but Satan is about to be released okay I know it's evil, I know it's very evil in this world and that is because the veil is thinning. That is because we have allowed the evil to come upon this world. You know, we have allowed it through our lusts and desires and our lukewarm hearts. But now is the time to strengthen that lukewarm and change it to a hot, burning, fiery heart. For Almighty God and His precious Son. The only way you can do that, brothers and sisters, is come into the Word of God. Even if you are forcing yourself to have one hour, no distractions, no phones, turn everything off, get the Bible and make one hour out of the 24 hours each day. You say to Father, you put it all before Him. You say, I suck at this. I want to know you more. I don't know how to do it. I am coming before your holy throne and giving you my heart. Please fill me, overfill me with oil and wisdom and discernment. I can't do this on my own because I feel so weak. I want you to strengthen me with faith. I want a faith like, you know, like Noah. We've all got to have a faith like Noah. Look at his story. He had to build a boat in the middle of nowhere when there was never rain on the earth before. Imagine that faith. Where people were laughing and scoffing and mocking him. But brothers and sisters, I don't know. When you, cause when you read, okay, let's go to Revelation... 11 let's have a look we're also going to go to Revelation um, 20 as well because I want to show you something and I want to show you the timeline and, and why I think we've come to the end Okay, well, for one, right here, okay, he saw an angel come down out of heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a chain in his hand, and he lay hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and bound him a thousand years, okay? And then when the thousand years has expired, Satan shall be loosed out of the prison. So let's go back to Revelation 9. So after the thousand years are finished, Satan will be released out of the prison, out of the bottomless pit. Look what happens on the fifth angel. I saw a star fall from heaven. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So it's the same pit, right? There was a key before and now there's a key again. Um, and there's only, there's only one that can open and close anything. And that's Yeshua Jesus Christ, right? And he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit. The smoke of a great furnace. What if this is Iceland? 
What if this is happening right now, brothers and sisters? And this is, I mean, this is why I say Satan cannot be on this earth right now. He's in the earth, but he cannot be on the earth because what is about to come out is going to be so terrifying and so massive and so out of our comprehension of evilness that is about to overcome this world. People will literally have heart attacks from the fear of what is coming upon this world. Okay, so you can see after the thousand years were finished, Satan will be released out of the bottomless pit. And here on the fifth angel, you see that the smoke arose out of the pit and he was, you know, he was released. Okay, so we'll go back to Revelation 20. Okay, so he's uh, going to be released out of his prison. And he's going to go and gather, um, go out to deceive the nations which are on the four quarters of the earth, Gog, Magog, to gather them together to battle. Um, okay, because people always say, oh, Satan's been deceiving people, you know, for since the last 2,000 years. No, he hasn't. His enemies, his, um, not, not his enemies, his uh, minions, you know, his demons and his, his workers. Okay, they're the ones that have been influencing man and possessing man and turning them into evil and giving them evil directions and things like this. And these people have been getting rewards for being faithful to their master. Okay, but what Satan's job is when he gets loosed out of this prison is not just to go and deceive the nations. There's a, a particular deception that's happening. And that is to get the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. That's the deception. It's not the deception of, you know, deceiving the average everyday Christian. No, the, the, his minions have been doing that. Okay, this is why we have the Lord's Prayer. You know, um, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation temptation but deliver us from the evil one okay deliver us from evil that's what it actually said deliver us from evil um for thine is the power the kingdom of glory forever and ever amen this is exactly what father's talking about because he said um you know if you love christ if you love his son you're going to pick up the cross and you're going to have tribulation the more you pick up the cross, the more you follow Christ, you're going to have tribulation in your life. But tribulation refines and purifies us and through trial and persecution, it refines us and makes us glow. You know, it is an awesome thing. Tribulation is fantastic. Without it, we would just be lukewarm, tiny little flickers. We don't want to be that. We want to be on fire. Okay, we want to be on fire. So this is the deception that Satan's doing, and he's got a short time left to do that. Okay, he's getting all the four quarters of the earth, and you can see this happening right now. His minions, his workers, you know, like it says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, it says these are coming after the workings of Satan. It's his workers. They're setting the groundwork right now for Gog and Magog war. And, you know, so many people are starting to say this now. When I said this in the beginning, like a month ago, I, when this war started, I said, this is Gog and Magog. And everybody was like, no, 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 that's not. That's happening, you know, after the thousand years. And you need to watch this. And this is sound Bible, biblical, uh, you know, things. Go and watch this and, you know, rightly divide the word. I'm like, no, I don't need to see that because I I trust not on my own understanding. I ask Father, I ask Father, I want your wisdom, your discernment, your will, your thoughts, your words, not mine. Show me the truth. I don't care how uncomfortable it is. Just show me what it is that is your will, Father, because that is all I crave, all I desire. And he showed me that this is the beginning of the Gog and Magog War. 
a lot more people are realizing this now and that's fantastic because that's all that matters you know that's all that matters because a lot of times in our humanness you know when we see people that mocked and scoffed us before saying oh this is what it is now it's like oh yeah that's what i said anyway i'm not going to be of that spirit as long as the message gets out there it doesn't matter i don't care i'm not looking for any glory here the glory goes all to father god and all to his son yeshua jesus christ all i want is the message to get out i don't care which way it comes but this is the beginning of Gog and Magog, brothers and sisters, absolutely. And Satan's foot soldiers are doing the work for him now, the groundwork. We're just waiting on Yeshua Jesus Christ to come down and unbind Satan from his prison. Okay, and then look what happens, brothers and sisters. Satan has a little season. Okay, that little season is exactly the same little season in Revelation 6, where it says, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge those that spilt our blood? And Father gives them a white robe. That's the, that's the dead in Christ rising first. And he says, But rest a little season. That's the same little season. It's the three and a half years. Okay? That's what we have to wait for. There, there is no wedding supper until... After this three and a half years, okay, this is why we get our robes, but notice we don't get crowns. We get crowns at the wedding supper, okay, because what the wedding supper is, is the coronation of the king. This is when we coronate Yeshua Jesus Christ, and we get our crowns, and this is why we're all laying our crowns down before his feet. It's going to be beautiful. It is going to be beautiful. But we're just getting the robes now. The robes are there. The reason we get our robes now and not our reward just yet, we have to rest and wait that little season. The reason we get our robes is because that's what represents the incorruptible body. There is no way on God's green earth that we could even face the presence of Father. We would implode. We would spontaneously combust if we saw Father face to face. So th there's no way of us even entering into heaven. We need to have our get given our incorruptible body, right? That is how that incorruptible body, that robe, that wedding garment, is the blood of His Son Yeshua Jesus Christ. That is the wedding garment, and this is why. When we go up there and stand before the Almighty God with the wedding garment on, which is the blood of Yeshua Jesus Christ, that is what Father sees. That is why we don't implode. Because all Father can see is that we clothed ourselves with the one thing that he asked for us to believe in, was his son and the finished work on the cross. Nothing we did absolutely nothing that we did but the finished work on the cross that is what we're clothed in this is why we can enter and stand before the throne but i want you to notice something here too okay so satan gets released he's going to have this gog and magog war right and and just to clarify too the only ones, okay, the only ones, um, you know, again, where I said th this time that's coming up very imminently, it's going to be the end of salvation, the end of the opportunity of salvation, because all through Revelation 13, there's the whole world wandering after the beast, the whole world, you know, um, wanting to worship the beast. You continue to read on and it says, and they repented not, you know, from all the plagues and stuff that were coming. They repented not. They repented not of their evilness, their wickedness, their adultery, their sorcery, their fornication. This is this lost people, brothers and sisters. And can you imagine how many lukewarm Christians are going to be so angry with God? They're going to be so angry with God when they realize that the doors were shut on them. 
and their heart will truly shine through. Well, not shine, but their heart will truly show their true colours. And many, many Christians will be blaspheming God, his tabernacle, and those that dwell in heaven. It's very sobering to think about, but the reality is it needs to be said. Because right now we still have time. We still have time. Okay, so look, this is what I'm trying to get at. Okay, so this, you know, this is the end, brothers and sisters. This is literally the end. What I'm saying here is that when the rapture happens, there is no more second chances. After that, the whole world will wander after the beast. After the, resurre- uh, after the resurrection rapture, the whole world will worship the beast. Those are all that never had their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then Satan has his three and a half years, a little season, to inflict as much pain and as much hurt and as much wrath on the people as possible because they, within their heart, within their soul and with their mind, effectively rejected Father and the gift that his son gave them. Or they didn't believe. They didn't truly believe. That's all that Father ever asked. Here's my beloved son. Hear him. Believe in him. This is it, brothers and sisters. This is it. This is what I was seeing the other day in my video It makes sense now that I'm reading and I'm so glad I continued on this study here. I just couldn't study for the last couple of days. Like I was just lost into what I was looking for, what I was searching for, how I was going to prove what Father showed me in the last video. And now as I'm reading this with you, brothers and sisters, this is it. This is it. The door is about to be shut. It's going to be opened. And then it's going to be shut. And that's, that's it. That's literally it. Satan's going to have his time, his allotted time. And this is why he is so wrath when he gets cast out of heaven. Because he has a short time left. That short time is a 42 months little season. And look what happens. After that little season, they went up to the breath of the earth and they compassed around the saints about and beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And then what happens? The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And look what happens next. The great white throne judgment. That's it, brothers and sisters. We are literally at the pinnacle point of the end of the opportunity of having salvation any day now any day now any hour any minute any second the books are going to be closed and the just will be just still the holy will be holy still The wicked will be wicked still. And that'll be it. That'll be it. Let let that be sober in your hearts and your mind. This is it, brothers and sisters. This is literally it. I know I've said that so many times. But I can't stress enough. That's, you know, I'm starting to see what's more important. You know, we're always hanging on to this you know, saying, oh, this is it for the rapture day. This has got to be it. It's got to be it. But I'm seeing now what we really should be looking for or what we had been looking for. It's just been, the veil's been lifted. It doesn't matter when the rapture is. It matters that that's it. That's the only chance there is. Because the ones that are left to endure Father's wrath, the wrath of the Lamb, and the wrath of Satan are those that had never had their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundations of the world. That's a hard truth. But it has to be said because we have to put an almighty effort into now. An 
almighty effort into now. Nothing. We've got, it's all guns blazing. We have to go in there a hundred percent. I think this is the meat and good ju- in in due season. It's all in all in f- now. We have to combine prayer. We have to have a combined prayer that Father can give us the strength and the confirmation. And the, we need to pray for our own. We need to ask. We need to be bold and come before the Holy Throne. And we need to say in our minds, in our hearts and in our souls, Father, I need an absolute sign from you. And you need to pick something that's so impossible, so impossible that only you and Father knows. And you need to say, Father, if this is the very end, if the doors are closing, I need you to show me this sign. I need you to, Father. Because I don't want to come and scare my loved ones away, but if this is it and you're going to show me this sign... I will do everything in my last power, my last breath that I have on this earth to tell those that I love and to tell and scream on the four quarters, on the rooftops that the end is near. Pick something that is so impossible that there's no doubt in your mind, brothers and sisters. It's the time to do it. I, I've never been one to ask Father for signs or anything like this, but I think he wants us to ask now. You know, reading in um, the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, um, you know, he says to King as here, he's like, ask me for a sign. And the king was like, no, nah, I don't need a sign. I don't need a sign. And so Father said to Isaiah, all right, then I will give you a sign. Okay, ask me for a sign. Ask me for a sign, brothers and sisters. Because, you know, we've, we've all been here for years. Some of us a lot longer than others. We've all been here where we're so sure on these days. But we've been looking for the wrong thing. Because we've been thinking, oh yeah, there's, there's more chance. There's more chance, you know, if the rapture turns out that I'm right on this day, woohoo for me, and, you know, then my loved ones can say, oh, they were right. All right, well, we better get right with God now. No, it's not about that. It's literally not about that anymore. That's it. The door's going to be closed. There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth in outer darkness. This is why the whole earth mourns. This is why here in Matthew 24. Okay. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, which is the rapture. And then shall all, all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he's going to send his angel with a great sound of a trumpet. They're going to gather his together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's the sign of the Son of Man. That's the rapture, brothers and sisters. And then the whole world is going to mourn. There's no second chance. There is no second chance. It is time to get right. You need to focus on your own salvation right now. And when you are sure and you're on track and you're on that straight and narrow path, then you're just to give every last breath. Like I said, ask for the sign. Ask for the sign, brothers and sisters. You know... When you think about the signs the Jews asked, they said, oh, yeah, you know, what will be the sign of the coming, you know, when are you coming, you know, what's the sign of your return or whatever. And then he said, you know, wicked and adulterous generation. The only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of um, Jonah. But this, we're not asking for the sign of the rapture, brothers and sisters. This is different. We are asking, Father, are the books closing 
Are the books closing, Papa? It's... Oh, my heart is so heavy. We just have to we just have to ask for that sign. We have to be bold. We have to come before the throne and ask for that sign. Because a lot of us need that. We need that little something, that reassurance, that personal confirmation that the Lord hears us. A lot of us don't know, don't feel like we're walking with him or that he hears us or that we're special to him. But he loves you so much. And what father would give you a snake if you asked for bread? Seek the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be given to you, brothers and sisters. Ask and you shall receive. I think if we knew, I think if we knew that the, there was a great chasm over the next hill that fell into a pit of flaming fire. If you knew that, if you were up on the hill and you could see this, you would do everything in your power to halt all the traffic that was coming that way. What person wouldn't? What person wouldn't do that? I think it's time, brothers and sisters. I think it's time. I don't think we've got that much time left. We have to be we have to be really sober minded about this. One for our own salvation. It's not as simple as saying, Yeah, I know I'm going to heaven because it's not that it's, you know, there's people saying, Lord, Lord, did I not do all this stuff in your name? And he says, I don't know who you are, get away from me. It's a real time, brothers and sisters, to seek what God's will is. Let's have a look at this. The seven, seven things that God loves. Okay, God loves the world, so we need to love one another. God loves sinners. Okay, he loved us. He sent his only begotten son to die for us. God loves those who believe in Jesus Christ. God loves those who love him. God loves those who keep his commandments. God loves those who, uh, who he corrects. That's so true. God loves justice. God loves the righteous. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves those who trust him. That's so true. He loves you when you trust him. He loves you when you believe, when you are a cheerful giver and you give freely without thinking twice about it because we would have nothing without him. We wouldn't even have a breath without our almighty God giving us that breath. We wouldn't have our children. We wouldn't have the house we live in. We wouldn't have the clothes on our back. We wouldn't even be alive. He loves the righteous. And righteousness is through our faith in his son. He loves justice. And he is going to display the most just act known to man. And even though it may seem horrendous at this point and this viewpoint and at this time, what is about to happen on this earth will be the biggest display of justice known to mankind. And he loves us. He loves those. He chastises those that he loves. 
even as a father, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Okay, this is why, you know, when our children do something wrong, we have to chastise them. Because if you do not tell your children not to lie or steal or hurt people, then they're just going to grow up as an adult and cause a world of pain. And you do not want to be responsible for that, brothers and sisters. So as we remain good parents and teachers to our children, we know that when we do wrong and we stray off that path, that it is good for us to be chastised as well, to come back onto that straight and narrow path and follow Father and ask of forgiveness for our iniquities. And the same thing. I want to have a look at the, the things that God hates. Ignorance. Ignorance. Arrogance, sorry. Arrogance. This describes a feeling of pride and looking down upon others. When we begin to think of ourselves more highly and with unparalleled importance, we are forgetting the fact that anything good in us is the result of Christ living in us. <laughs> yes, nothing we do is good, nothing. The only reason we do anything good, brothers and sisters, is because Christ lived within us. We do nothing good. A lying tongue. <laughs> lying is the worst. And I have such a big problem with my 12-year-old daughter. She's lying. Lying is just very hard for me to tell her and to make her understand how bad lying is. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devices wicked schemes. This encompasses thinking of or conceiving evil against any individual or group for personal benefit or other misguided objectives. Feel that quick uh, feet that are quick to rush into evil. Those uh, whose feet are quick to rush into evil display no resistance whatsoever to the sin. We expected to be wise in this regard. In the Garden of Eden, Eve had the first experience of temptation. She displayed no resistance to the serpent's temptation. Instead, as soon as the devil attracted her to the fruit, she saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. And then she sinned. False witness who pours out lies, again with a lying, so dangerous line. A man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Brothers are created by God to live in unity. Believers are brothers and sisters since they have one Father God and one brother, Yeshua Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> they got that right. One Father God and one brother, Jesus Christ. Okay, we're supposed to be the peacemakers, brothers and sisters, and love one another. It is a privilege to be called the son of God, sons and daughters of God. So these are so important. You know, and, and here we, we see even more of an example, okay? We see, for as in the days that were before the flood, so before the rapture. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Do you notice, brothers and sisters, in all the accounts of Matthew 24, Luke 21 and Mark 13 of the coming of the Son of Man chapters, notice that Christ never talks about the mark of the beast. Notice he never mentions it as a warning or a sign of the end. That's because he's talking about the end of salvation. Those that are going into this to the um to get their you know 
to get that mark. The whole world wandering after the beast. Oh, I don't know. Okay, and um, so I'll read that again. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. <clears throat> and they knew not until the rapture came and took them all away. And so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall be two in the field, one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other one left. Notice, brothers and sisters, that the mark entails that we can't buy or sell. And notice what these people are doing here before the flood or before the tribulation. They're drinking, they're marrying, they're giving in marriage. In Lot's day, they're planting and building. In other words, it's right now. That's the two differences. This is happening before the mark of the beast is coming. There's going to be two in the field that are working, brothers and sisters. That's not going to be happening during the mark of the beast time. When people are being forced to worship. Okay, two women will be grinding at the mill. And in the book of uh, Mark or Luke, uh, Mark it is, I think, it says two, two people will be sleeping in one bed. This is accounting for all the time zones. It's going to happen like that. Watch, therefore, because you're not going to know what hour your Lord's going to come. And once he comes, that's it. The Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he looks for him not. This is that evil, wicked servant that says, Ah, oh, my Lord is delaying his coming. And he's going to come in an hour that he's not aware of. And he's going to cut him asunder and point him and his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This, this was his servant. This was his this is the the foolish virgin, brothers and sisters. The virgins, the five wise, the five foolish, they both love the Lord. The Bible is not talking to the lost. The Bible's not talking to the world. The Bible is talking to the lukewarm and the on fire Christians. Other than that, you're of the world. The lukewarms are the five foolish. And that is the one who says in his heart, oh, my Lord is delaying his coming. He's never going to come. I'm not quite sure I even believe in this rapture or this deliverance or this salvation or this hapazzo, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And then he finally, he finally probably confesses it with his mouth. Oh, Lord, I'm so sick of waiting. Is this even true? You know. I mean, I'll be completely honest with you. <laughs> now that I'm saying this, I've noticed that this is sort of, I suppose in a way, um, you know, this is my big thing. Where, you know, days come and go and everything like this because being a watcher for so long, a watchwoman who, you know, looks at dates and I've done this for years now, you know, after a while it does take its toll on you. And you do, not that I've ever questioned the salvation, um, that's 100% a surety. I, I know that no matter what we're going to, even if we had to go through terrible tribulation, I knew that we, not a hair on our head would perish. We'd see these things with our eyes, but we'd be protected. But, you know, you get that voice, oh, it's start living life. You've missed out on so much life. You know, you've been looking at this for the last 7 or 14 or 10 years. Look at all the things that you've lost. Go and enjoy your life. Go and enjoy your life. God wants you to enjoy your life. You know, you get that crap that runs through your head. And yes, of course, Father wants you to enjoy your life. But be uh, the joy of your life should be in him. Not in in worthless, materialistic things. Um, so I get it. I totally get it. I get why, um, you know, and as soon as my mind starts drifting into that, you know, 
when it's like, ah, oh, is it ever going to happen? You know, into that mindset, then Satan comes right in with it, with that crap, makes me start watching. He doesn't make me start. I do it. I fall into temptation and I watch worldly things and not bad things, but just, you know, um, you know, worldly content creators and on YouTube and stuff like that. You know, the stuff that I watch when I want to give my mind a break from studying for a little bit, you know, something that I'll eat dinner with or whatever. So it's not so hardcore all the time. But, you know, then I start thinking about my own life and, oh, that'd be nice to have. And, you know, it just goes from one thing to another until you realize that, you know, you're feeling a little bit like your oil's running low. And this is, I think, what's been happening to me the last sort of couple of days. That's why I haven't been on here. And I knew all day today, all day today, (laughs) thinking about it now, my spirit was like, you need to go and make a video, even if you don't have anything to say. Just go and make a video. You'll start speaking about the scriptures and then, you know, Father will take over and he will, you know, he will revive you. He will fill that cup back up. And it's so true. I feel so much better now. Even though, I, like I said, I originally tend to come on here and talk about that place in Iceland. And look, here we are. We're probably, what, two hours in, <laughs> into the video? What are we? A minute, uh, an hour and 27. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, I love you so much. And it is my duty on this earth as a child of God to bring the good word of the gospel to you and sometimes the hard word of the truth as well and I speak equally to myself as I do to you there's all things that I you know I have I have struggles just like everybody else does you know I've shared my testimony with you before and um, you know those of you who weren't on my live and didn't hear my testimony I've, I've been through it all I had a drug addiction like I'm talking hardcore drugs with needles okay I've been in the bottle and the barrel um, and then uh, the, and then I had you know from the age of 15 until November of 2022, I smoked weed every day, every night. And I drank wine excessively. So I am no, I am, you know, I'm the lowest of the low. But my heart for father is something that I I'm very proud of, you know, I have a lot of happiness in knowing how much I love my father in heaven and his beautiful son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And that's, this is the one thing I feel that even though this, every good thing is like filthy rags towards father, this is the one good thing I feel on this earth that I can contribute to the kingdom of heaven is to talk about the good news and to talk about the hard truths like this that we need not to muck around anymore this is life and death because I love you so much and I don't want to just fluff around and give you pink fluffy roses and tell you everything's going to be okay because it's not it's not going to be okay Unless we know our heart, soul and mind are in the exact place where they need to be. And our eyes are upon the sky, waiting patiently for the appearing of our Lord and Saviour, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. So, like I said to you before, in Revelation 20, okay, you see that Satan gets loosed out of the pit. And then he goes to have this Gog and Magog war and then gets devoured and thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, then in Revelation 11, we see these two witnesses here. Um, 
you know, and I looked right into the two witnesses because you're like, you know, the majority of the Christians will say this is Moses and Elijah or, you know, um, but I've seen many videos now, it's very sound scriptural based video. They're not people. They are not people, brothers and sisters. And, um, you know, just go and have a look for yourself. They're not people because it goes into, you know, um, these are the two olive trees and candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And long story short, basically it's in Jeremiah 4, I believe. He talks about the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. And what they are, what they represent in a nutshell, is um, Israel and the church. Okay, these are the two witnesses that stand before the God of the earth. It is um, the Israel, uh, Israels, the Jews, if you want to call them. Um, you know, they bring across... The commandments of God and then the Christians they bring the testimony of Yeshua Jesus Christ the spirit of prophecy those two things together witness the God witness our father in heaven okay and isn't it funny you look at the three biggest religions right Judaism Christian and Islam okay notice that Islam is one third one third out of the three big big faiths. Okay, and what does Satan bring down with his tail? One third of the angels. And it is um you know, and they have thirty percent <laughs> again with the one third, they have thirty percent of the world believes is 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 um Muslim, right? They believe there is no greater God than Allah. And Muhammad is his prophet, which is in replace for there's no greater God than our almighty father, Jehovah in heaven, and Yeshua Jesus Christ is his son. That's literally what the Islamic Shahada is. Okay, and this is the, isn't it interesting? I think it's called Shahada. Shahada is like when you first become um, a Muslim, and anyone can do this. This is literally the first thing you do. You have to say the Shahada, which is there is no other God. There is no, there is no greater God than Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. So you are literally confessing with your mouth that Allah is better and greater. Very dangerous. Okay, very, very dangerous. <laughs> Um, so yes, so here in Revelation 11, again, I just want to really uh, rain home on the fact that this is the end, brothers and sisters, and I'm talking about the end of salvation. There's the Satan's little season still to come, but this is the end for us. There's no point in caring. It doesn't matter if it goes for 10,000 years, Satan's time. You know what I'm saying? The fact of the matter is, if you want to be in the eternal kingdom in paradise, eternally, and have salvation, then this is the end for us. Okay, so you see these the testimony, right? And um, and after three days and a half, the spirit of God entered them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Jesus, I wonder what that sounds like. Is that the whole earth will mourn and wail when they see this great sign from heaven in Matthew 24? Then, she, then, she, um, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and, and then, all, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. I heard a great voice from heaven saying, come up hither. That's exactly like in Revelation 4. Come, I heard the great voice of a trumpet that says, come up hither. And immediately I was in the spirit standing before the throne. And look what happened to them. They ascended up into heaven in a cloud. And their enemies beheld them. And the whole world mourned. What happens? In the same hour, there was a great earthquake. That's, that's that earthquake in Seal 6. Okay? 
a great earthquake and the men and the rich men the small the great they ran to the caves and asked the rocks to fall on them saying hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of god because the great day of their wrath has come the tenth part of the city fell in the earthquake were slain men of seven thousand and the remnant were frightened okay the remnant that's 144,000 okay those 144,000 are going to be the true bloodline Israel the true um, 12 tribes of Israel the 144,000 they are purely there because they have the seal of the living God nothing will touch them okay because you see that they get redeemed I think in Revelation 14 nothing touches them but they are there for a court case that they're, they're not for a court case for uh, the evidence the witness the final um, proclamation of what why the reason why hail and plagues and all all this stuff's happening you know to the wicked they're just there to witness and give testimony of why this is going on Okay, the second woe is passed, and behold, okay, so you've just had the the, the two witnesses, which are, um, you know, the true Israelites, the true Jews, and um, the, what do you call it, the true Christians, which represent the testimony of Father, uh, the, the Word of God and the testimony of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Okay, you've just had them raptured, which essentially is... The dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud. Okay, all eyes will see them. Revelation 1 7 Every eye will see him, even those that pierced him. Okay, and um, look at this the second woe is passed. Behold, the third woe comes quickly. The seventh angel sounded. There was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. And then the four and twenty elders are there, because what are they there for? For judging, right? And the nations were angry, and no wrath has come. There you go, brothers and sisters. The wrath has come. So this, this is representing us, brothers and sisters. It is representing us. Now, I know you may be thinking, oh, what does that mean we have to die for three and a half days? No. There may be, I don't know what this means, but I know it says that there are some standing here that will not see death. Okay, so it's not... I don't know. I don't know, brothers and sisters. I still have to study into this a bit more. But I know it's got a lot to do with Christ's sign to the to the his enemies. He said, "The only sign, the only sign I'm going to give you, is the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so shall the Son of Man be." So that is the sign, and this happens to be three and a half days. It's the sign of Jonah. So there's going to be something that happens. I think it's an allegory for something. But um, either way, even if we do, even if we do, okay, look what happens to us. You know, um, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and a great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies beheld them. Okay, they ascended to heaven in a cloud. This is very obvious that this is the rapture where Jesus Christ meets us in the clouds. Okay, because you've got two instances. You've got uh, the one where he doesn't touch the ground, where he meets us in the clouds and he calls us up to him. And then you've got the second instance where um, his feet are going to touch the ground and split the Mount of Olives in two. That's right at the end of the three and a half years. So, brothers and sisters, I, I hope and I pray, I don't know, I can show you much more. 
but you can see here that um, you know the nations are angry the wrath has come it shows you that because have a you know what the amazing thing is that I've just realized here okay the wrath has come this is also like the reason why okay that was the seventh angel wasn't it that we just read the seventh angel okay and the kingdoms of this world have been given to the kingdom of god all right and then notice here in revelation 8 it says and when he opened the seventh seal so we had the seventh angel before we got the seventh seal here there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour what always comes before judgment silence there you go I've just made that connection right here, right now. That is, this is why they interlock and they're not in corresponding order. There is silence in heaven on the seventh seal with the seventh angel. Okay. Silence in heaven and judgment's about to come upon this earth. Because they are about to, um, and, um, and again, in Daniel 12, when it says that at the time of the rapture, the dead in Christ will rise, but also those that um, will be risen for everlasting shame and contempt. So the wicked will be dead, uh, be risen too. And so it's going to be the dead wicked that are risen and all the wicked people on this earth. And that makes so much sense. That is so just and so fair. When all the wicked people from all of time are risen, this is why the whole world will see him, even those that pierced him. That means figure figuratively, you know, the people today, our day and age, um, poking fun at him and mocking him and scoffing Christ and making fun of his crucifixion and all that. And literally, the literal people that stabbed Christ in the side on the cross will be witness to this it's the end brothers and sisters it is literally the end okay it's literally the end they're going to see this and this is why they're preparing us for the zombie apocalypse because there's going to be dead wicked that are raised and all of hell will follow him the writer whose name is death all of hell will follow him and they're going to have power to kill one fourth of the earth. Okay. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Okay. Here comes all the, the plagues and things that are going to happen. Okay. And then we go down here to the seventh angel. Okay, see, the sixth angel uh, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. They've got, you know, the 200 million army. And then um, the rest of the men who were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither they can see nor hear nor walk neither repented they of their murders or their sorcerers or their fornications nor their theft these people are gone they're wicked brothers and sisters they're literally gone and here we are the seventh one right and i saw a mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud this is yeshua he's clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head okay who who's associated with the cloud christ why is he got a rainbow upon his head because in revelation 1 it talks about father's throne but there was a rainbow round about so christ has a rainbow upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as a pillar of fire okay here's the seventh angel brothers and sisters okay we go down here but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophet. 
And I heard a voice from heaven spoke to me again saying, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the angel and I said, Give me the little book. And he said, Take it and eat it up and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in your mouth as sweet as honey. Okay, then we're going to go to the Revelation 11. Okay, so you can see, brothers and sisters, you can see that um, that it's going to be the end. Okay, so... Oh, where is it? Here. See, that um, they therefore rejoice you in heaven... And you that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. So there you go, brothers and sisters. That's it. We are literally at the end of salvation, and then Satan has these 42 months reign of absolute chaos and destruction. And then what's happening after that is we skip all the way to... Revelation 20, once Satan's finished his reign of destruction, um, like I said, the great white throne appears and um, earth and heaven flee away because Father's face is there. So earth and heaven will flee away from his face. And then it says, I saw the dead, the small, the great, stand before God. It's judgment now, brothers and sisters. It's literally judgment. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. This is our reward. This is when we get our crowns, brothers and sisters. Okay. And the sea gave up their dead, which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. And they judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of the fire. And this is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What happens next? I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth were passed away. And then I saw new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Behold, I make all things new. Write these words, they are true and faithful. So there you go, brothers and sisters, there you go. That's a description of the New Jerusalem. Okay, and they shall see his face. We're going to finally be face to face with the Almighty God and we're going to have his name in our forehead. And that is that. So I hope I have been clear in explaining what Father has shown me. And I know it's probably a sad message and a hard message to to hear it is a hard message for me to speak but I trust father I trust father that how everything's going to work out will be for the glory of him and that's all that matters okay that's all that matters and unfortunately well not unfortunately but the 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 scripture that comes to mind whoever doesn't hate their mother their father their brother their sister um, or whoever loves them more than me. Uh, what is that one? I've got to find it. Okay, it's in Luke fourteen twenty six. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, 
he cannot be my disciple. Now that may seem incredibly harsh to you and me. But in reality, brothers and sisters, as I said before, every breath we breathe, we owe to Almighty Father. And what this means here is not to go and hate your mother and your father. We are supposed to honour and love our mother and father. But it's to say we are to stop turning back and being like Lot's wife and going and pining over them and going, oh, I can't live without you. I don't want to go to heaven without you. I don't want to live eternal life without you. We have to be strong, brothers and sisters. We have to have the faith. Look what ha- Lot's wife is such a perfect example. You know, she had two sons that remained in Sodom and Gomorrah. And this is why she turned around. Okay? Because her sons shoot her off and said, Oh, whatever, whatever, woman, you're crazy. She, they didn't want to go. They wanted nothing to do with it. And, you know, the father and his daughters, they ran and they didn't look back. They were able to live. But the mother turned around because of her heart was with her children. You have to understand this message. I know I know as you know, as human beings with empathy and sympathy, it's hard it's a hard message, but I just need you to understand, brothers and sisters, that Father has to come first and we have to trust him in all things. This is the most important thing that we can do now is know that the plan is perfect and everything was written down before the foundations of this world and it's going to be absolutely perfect the way it turns out and we're not going to be grieving and carrying on as soon as this is all done and dusted we're going to be healed of all pain and we're not going to remember the former things so just have faith in that Be of good cheer and encourage each other with these words. But like I said, brothers and sisters, please look at your own life. I mean, my life, my things that I have to do uh, is I have to fast because I've got a big struggle with food. I have a huge struggle with food. And I got myself into this stupid mindset of, oh, well, the world is ending anyway. I'm just going to concentrate all my time and and research into Bible studies and videos and stuff like this. And I've just got myself a bad old habit of just eating and doing my Bible studies, thinking that, you know, that's all good. But it's not. And I I feel like crap. I look like crap. (laughs) And, um, you know, so... I need to fast and I need to completely go on a complete diet and um, I need to really to nourish my body, to nourish my mind and my soul and my spirit because I think that's the one thing I'm lacking. That's the the one big thing is my, my weakness is, you know, because I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't go out, I don't party. I've just given myself this stupid idea that, all right, well, I'll just eat then, okay? And that's that's not good. Anything that's done in excess is just terrible and it's a sin. And so I went and bought all my, I'm going to, <laughs> the weirdest thing is I got onto this, this, uh, this particular diet, it's the egg diet. <laughs> And so I went and bought myself 30 eggs today. Basically, for the next 10 days, I'm going to be living off eggs, watermelon, salads, and chicken. <laughs> and tons and tons and tons of water. And basically, it's all the the idea of it is all the nutrients that I'm supposed to have in the different types of food, lots of protein from the eggs and stuff. And because um, I've, I've got to knock the sugar cravings and these salt cravings and all this other stuff that I've got going on. And and I I really want to dedicate it to Father. I really want to present myself as a living sacrifice for his kingdom. And I can't do that when I'm a living fast food convenience store. (laughs) 
So that's my struggle and that's um, that's what I'm going to be doing for the next 10 days. It's going to be hard. So I ask you, brothers and sisters, please pray for me. Please pray for my strength and my resilience in this because I really want to overcome this. I really want to overcome this. This has such been a battle for me. Um, yes, yeah, so I really want to overcome this. Please pray for me, brothers and sisters, as I pray for all of you, you my beloved brothers and sisters. I pray for all your family, your loved ones, and um, you know, I pray for your blessings. So I'll leave you with that, brothers and sisters. And um, <clears throat> as I said, please ask Father for that sign. Let Him know that you're serious and you wanna, you wanna go strong. You wanna run straight up to that. Um, finish line you want to run that race strong at the end and you want to imagine if we could all win one soul between now and the end into the kingdom of heaven if we could do that brothers and sisters one soul each oh, the kingdom of heaven would be cheering it would be cheering that would be fantastic so i love you brothers and sisters very much with all my heart soul and mind Remember, Hecla, okay, gateway to hell, Iceland on fire, possible location of the bottomless pit. Maybe that's why we need to be looking at that and, you know, checking out what's going on there a little bit more. But with that being said, um, I love you very much. May Father bless you. I hope this video has blessed you as it has me. And if I do not see you in the next video, I will see you in the skies. God bless you. I love you. Bye-bye.